I am standing atop a vast field of sand, the Morel Dunes, part of a striking and little-known national natural landmark right here in Humboldt County, California. And this is one of the most pristine natural dune systems that still remain in the Pacific Northwest. Today, I'm going to tell you the story of how these dunes were created after a major earthquake from the Cascadia subduction zone rocked this coastline over 300 years ago, leading to this series of geologic events that created these dunes. And this isn't just a story about geology, because in the path of these advancing dunes is an ancient and rare forest. It's a relic from the Ice Age. And as these dunes are moving in, they're slowly smothering large swaths of this ancient forest. Leading edges of this dune have already reached Humboldt Bay. A naturalist from the Friends of the Dunes Nature Center is going to tell us more about this fascinating ancient forest that lies in the path of these dunes. It's the last of its kind in this area. So I invite you to join me as we explore the Malel Dunes and learn about one of the most amazing and dramatic geologic and botanical stories to be found here in Humboldt, outdoors. And once you climb out of that rare, weird dune forest on top of that giant sand sheet, it feels like you're out on the moon. Your, your entire vision is just open sand dune and maybe a little peak of the ocean. And it just feels like such an alien landscape, so different than anywhere else in Humboldt County. To begin this story, I'm heading down the west side of the Molel Dunes to get to the beach. These dunes were first created around 300 years ago. Now this landscape behind me back then, before the dunes, would have looked a lot different. As I learned from Justin, a naturalist at the Friends of the Dunes Nature Center. Um, over 300 years ago, our coastal forests would have looked much different before the dunes were there. They would have been relatively low, flat forests, constantly getting hammered down and pushed back by the harsh winds and salinity off of the ocean. Oh yeah, this is an ideal location to tell you the somewhat simplified story of how geologists believe the Malayal Dunes were formed. It all began in the year 1700 when a tremendous earthquake shook this area. It caused this coastal land to subside several feet or even more. And as it did so, all this beach area became submerged under the ocean. Over time, the longshore currents would have carried sand into the submerged area, building layer upon layer of new sand over the old beach sand. The result is that there would have been an unusually large accumulation of sand in this area. Then the northwesterly winds would have carried the drier sand inland, especially during the dry summer months, creating four dunes. Now, those four dunes kept advancing inland, growing larger and larger, 40 feet, 60 feet, 80 feet tall. And the dunes haven't stopped. Over the last 300 years, 
they have been advancing to their ultimate destination, Humboldt Bay, which is less than a mile away. And now we're gonna go back up on the dunes, cross to the far side and see what happens when these dunes collide with the forest on the other side. This dead treetop is the last remnant of a once thriving ancient forest that now lies about 60 feet below is completely buried by the sand. You find these kind of haunting skeleton forests along some of the most rapidly advancing edges of the sand dune. Although these dunes do extinguish some life, they also create new types of life, such as this yellow sand verbena. And Justin explained to me that this plant is specifically adapted to life on these shifting sand dunes, as well as some other plants, animals, and insects that thrive in these sand dunes. So yellow sand verbena specifically has these massive tubers underground, which is what's creating that sort of hummock in the sand. This enables the plant to survive in these extremely drought-like conditions, even though it isn't able to get as much water, it can hold that water into the roots. So if these tubers ever get exposed, it's extremely common to see little bite marks out of them. And that's typically from our black-tailed jackrabbits or brush rabbits. But yeah, even though these landscapes can look barren and absent of life, these are actually really um, dense ecosystems with a, a variety of different life forms out there. Ah, we've come across some tracks left by a gray fox that passed through here. Now, gray fox tracks are very distinctive and easy to spot because the paw prints are singular. There's just one paw print, one paw print, one after the other. And that's because when a gray fox walks, after it puts his front paw into the sand and moves forward, the back paw goes exactly into the track made by the front paw. And they continue through and make the straight line of prints. And it turns out that finding and identifying tracks in the dunes is a favorite pastime of Justin's too. A supremely fun thing to do is to take out our coastal naturalist manual here from Friends of the Dunes. You can go out with these different pages and identify I'd say at least a dozen on any given day, different animals and insects or reptiles out in our sand dunes. We have our brush rabbits, black-tailed jackrabbits, deer, mice, our gray fox, striped skunks, and our raccoons. You'll often see evidence of them digging up for the grubs out in the dunes. And one of the oddest is you'll see a small trench that goes through the dunes, and it's the ciliated beetle. And rather than walking along the sand, like most beetles, it kind of has little flippers, and it actually swims under the sand, so you're not as much seeing its footprint track as you're seeing the collapsed tunnel as this beetle swims around the sand and then emerges to feed, which is really spectacular. So now we've reached the eastern edge of the Millel Dunes and we're going to descend one of its leading edges to get a closer look at a remarkable sight. And that's where these advancing dunes first encounter the forest.
Okay, here we are. A leading edge of the Malal Dunes. It's taken around 300 years for the sand to reach this point from the beach, which is less than a mile from here. Now, geologists believe these dunes are traveling at an average rate of about six feet per year. And as they go, they're slowly covering this older forest. Here's the top of a tree of one of them. This tree was probably 10 feet before it started getting buried by the sand. And Justin explained to me, this forest is very unique. So the odd thing about our coniferous dune forest out here is a lot of these species, according to our foresters, seem to have essentially been left over their remnants from the most recent ice age. They were able to adapt and get by in our coastal dunes, and it's a really interesting niche ecosystem where they're far separated from the rest of their populations. You know, before we head into the forest, let's just take a little time to take a closer look at this absolutely fascinating interface between these sand dunes and this much older forest. Well, now we're heading east away from the advancing Moel Dunes to explore this forest in a little more detail. Now, as we walk on this trail, it goes up and down. Well, that's because we're actually walking on an ancient dune system. Uh, geologists estimate it was originally established six or 7,000 years ago. And over time, it's weathered down and stabilized to allow this forest to thrive here. And Justin had some interesting details. Tell me about this forest. My favorite pine tree that we call the shore pine, it's a, a close relative and subspecies of a much more known plant, the lodgepole pine. But the thing about our shore pine, the subspecies, is their maximum height is only as high as the nearby dunes that are able to protect them from that harsh wind and salt spray. So the, the shore pine is perhaps my favorite uh, coniferous tree out in our dunes, but they also facilitate a few different fir species. You'll find Douglas fir out there as well, and another more well-adapted and known coastal variety, Sitka spruce, will also find out in our dunes. As you walk in this forest, you come across these mats of this sort of a bright fluorescent lichens that grow on the ground. They don't grow in trees like, for example, the lace lichen around here. Now, these are known as an Ice Age relic called reindeer lichen, and I'll let Justin tell you more in details about that. What's really interesting about reindeer lichen though, besides it looking beautiful, and I think it kind of looks like brains on the ground, it's very interesting. This is a, another species that's been left over from the most recent ice age and is far separated from other parts of its population. The name reindeer lichen coming from reindeer migrating across the Arctic tundra and using this plant, a lichen, as one of their main food sources. And of course, reindeer lichen still exists up in the Arctic tundra and many other ecosystems still enabling those different creatures. So it's a really special and, and odd plant that still remains here in our dunes. Oh, this is one of the other great curiosities you come across in this forest. You, you find these little piles of pine needles and sticks and they're covered with ants crawling over the surface. They're built by thatching ants. And I'll let Justin tell you about these fascinating insects. We have a really wonderful insect out there, our thatching ants of the dunes. And they'll make these massive mounds that can be about 10 years old. They get the name thatching ant because when you get close to their mounds, you'll see that they're harvesting different vegetation. And 
building their mound out of thatch. If you go out there when the sun is directly hitting one of their mounds and you look closely, you'll see all the little thatching ants moving the thatch, essentially trying to open up windows to let the heat and steam escape out of their mound. And then the opposite on those cold days, you know, creating more structure, closing off those windows, as well as being much slower and not moving as much. Well, we made it through the forest and we have arrived here at Humboldt Bay's Mad River Slough. And it looks like this furthest leading edge of the Malel Dunes has reached it too. But you know, if you're feeling a little bit wistful learning that large swaths of that beautiful forest we just walked through will eventually be covered up by these sand dunes. You know, it helps to sort of step out of the human perspective of time. Eventually, the Moel dunes will weather down and they'll stabilize and allow a beautiful forest to thrive in five or six thousand years from now. It's just another one of the continuing stories to be found here in Humboldt. Outdoors! Outdoors!